we're doing something different now. Um, starting next week, we're going to have a special Wednesday service because Memorial, Memorial Day is next weekend, right? And a lot of people are traveling for that time. So on Wednesday, we're having a special service at 6 o'clock for all those people with Memorial Day that are going to be gone on the weekend. Okay? So now you have a, a, this opportunity to come and worship before you take out of town on Friday night. All right? And so then the, the people with the Unite service, the Sunday night service, they've decided and they talked to a lot of their people and said, they said, yeah, during summertime, it'd be cool to have a Wednesday night service. And so starting next, next week, they're going to move um, to Wednesday night. So every Wednesday night during the summertime, they will have their service at 6 o'clock out in the foyer. So uh, if you have a, you're a lake home or something or you're going to be gone, here's your opportunity to come and worship with your church at 6 o'clock on Wednesday night. And uh, then we will not have a Sunday night during summer. Okay. Anything else you want to add to that? Pretty, did I cover it all? All right. So everyone has an opportunity then to come. A couple of things in July I wanted to point out. Coming up, I want you to mark your calendar. Vacation Bible School will be a July 11th through the 13th. A lot of you guys volunteer to help with Vacation Bible School. Well, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I thought it was because I did a great job on the announcement. Um, but VBS is coming up, and so soon Amy, Amy's down in Florida right now, one of our children's pastors. She's down there at uh, Universal Studios. She had to go check out Harry Potter World, too, and with all her kids. But anyway, um, we will uh, have sign-ups pretty soon. As soon as she gets back, probably she'll start that. Sign-ups for leaders and that sort of thing, and then we'll eventually get all the kids involved in signing up for a vacation Bible school uh, July 11th through the 13th. And then one other date in July I want you to mark down is we're having our all-church float trip. July 28th, that's a Thursday. Thursday, July 28th, take off work. It's worth it. You can rent a kayak, a canoe, or a raft if you have a lot of kids. And so anyway, we'll be taking that. I'll be your guide, um, and it's a lot of fun. People say sometimes, why don't you have it on the weekend? Have you seen the rivers on the weekends? Yeah, and it's in, you know, most of it's language that a preacher has never heard before. And you don't want to, you don't want to let kids hear it too. Anyway, on Thursday, there won't be hardly anyone on the river. And so we kind of have it to ourselves. I'll be your guide. And in fact, it's a lot cheaper when you go with us um, because the, uh, the outfitter knows me very well. And so they give me a good discount. And also then because it's the church taking a trip, we don't have to pay sales tax on any of that too. So it's kind of nice to, um, to have that uh, and be a little cheaper and it's a lot of fun the kids get up and jump off stuff and uh, we we get to swim out in the river and such it's beautiful there it's on the Niagara River and so anyway um, take off that day Thursday July 28th we don't have any uh, missions minute or anything like that in fact uh, this Sunday it's easy easy like Sunday morning It was pretty good, wasn't it? All right. All right. Well, guys, I want to invite the ushers to come forward to receive our tithes and offerings. If you are visiting with us for the very first time, just allow the offering um, bowls to pass you by. Um, we're just very happy that all of you are here with us. Our, a lot of the people that are doing an uh, offering today is uh, um, with the disaster response team today and if you might remember our disaster response team began they began back 11 years ago today remember that some of you can't forget it 11 years ago today we had the tornado that hit Joplin um, and we sent out people um, the next morning you know kind of hit I was out doing search and rescue but the next morning um, we had people arriving to the church they didn't know what else to do but they knew they wanted to come to church 
and we were sending them out into teams. We had four teams out working. We set up a hotel here. We set up a store here. We set up a restaurant here to take care of the people of Joplin. We had about 30, 30, 30 some people that had their house, houses destroyed or so bad you couldn't live in them for a long time. And uh, so we um, had them all up here and we tried to take care of them the best we could. We had money from the offering that Sunday. So I started giving out cash to our church people that needed. And then we went, as soon as the banks were finally open, we went and got a bunch of cash so we could help our families in our church. Um, that was a tough time. We did have one person die in the tornado. If, have you seen our butterfly down by the road? If you haven't, as you leave, look on the right, and there's a butterfly. It's actually very, it's a very big butterfly, but it looks small, you know, uh, from a distance. But anyway, that's in honor of the one person we lost in the, to the uh, tornado, but also for all the people that went through that tragic day. Uh, May 22nd, 11 years ago. In fact, that we, we talked about the butterfly people because we had several families in our church that experienced the butterfly people. And that's how kids explained it. And we know those are, but th those are uh, not butterfly people, but they're angels. In fact, uh, the White family, um, we uh, actually had uh, the next Easter, I talked about angels during Easter service and we had a video and they talked about their experiences and how they, the kids, saw butterfly people um, after the tornado. So that's pretty cool. And uh, the whole community gathered together and helped one another. That's what it's all about. Amen. Yes, and Carl Junction, we went up there to Carl. Um, in fact, the disaster response team, we've helped out in uh, um, different things that, that, that people needed. And so we go out and help. Father, um, as we give to you, we know that amazing things happen when we are faithful to the call. And one part of that call is to be a generous people. And so we give to you today, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Ken. In our prayer time today, Ty's going to lead us in our prayers. Um, we had a couple of people in the hospital. Becky Steubing um, had knee replacement. She attends this service. She had knee replacement surgery, and she's home now. And Carolyn Coleman, who attends the Saturday night service that we have, um, she was in the hospital, um, and uh, she is home now. And I don't believe, anyway, that we have anyone in the hospital right now. Harold Speckerman and Bonnie Tesh are uh, both in rehab facilities, so continue to pray for them as well. Ty? God, we thank you for meeting us here in your house this morning for your invitation for all of us to come and meet with you here and meet with other believers that are here to worship you for your goodness and your mercy. God, we know that you're with us wherever we go, every day of our lives, but we thank you that we can always count on you. 
meeting us here. In fact, you're here before we even get up in the morning. God, so many of us look forward to joining together and being in your house and in your presence and, and worshiping you every Sunday morning. But God, for those that can't be here this morning for so many different reasons, we ask for your blessing to be on them as well, for people that are home recovering from illness and injury and surgery and so many other different things. We ask that you would heal and strengthen their bodies and that you would bless them with the presence of your spirit and that they would know that you were there with them as well. And God, we take time this morning to remember what our community has been through. And God, for so many people, we think back to the tornadoes that we've dealt with on this day. And for so many people, it's just tragedy. But God, I thank you that you give us the insight and the vision to see you at work in the worst situations in the world. So God, for those of us that know you, we look back on the two tornadoes that have devastated our community here on this day. And we thank you that you have given us the ability to see you at work, and that's what we remember more than anything. We don't remember the destruction and the tragedy, but we remember your goodness in the midst of all of that. And God, I ask that you would always give us the ability to see you at work in every aspect of our lives, in the good and the bad, no matter what's going on, that the first thing that we would look for is you in the midst of everything that's happening. And God, that's why we come into your house this morning. We come to be with you and to see your goodness and to feel your presence. To come and unburden ourselves of the things that we've carried around with us all week and to just rest in your presence. So God, as we continue this service and we continue to glorify you with everything that we do. We ask that your spirit would remove all of the ob obstacles that we have placed between us and you, the things that keep us from fully glorifying you with everything that we do, that you would enable us to worship you with everything that we have this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let us stand and lift our voices and let our praises ring today. <laughs>
God, you are faithful to love us, to forgive us, and to send your messenger today to, that we may hear your word spoken, Lord. Speak mighty words through him. Bless the service as we continue. In your name we pray. Amen. That was right out of the Bible in Proverbs chapter 31. It's entitled, A Wife of Noble Character. Um, and uh, kind of leads into what I'm doing. As you know, last week I started a five-part series on women of the Bible. And so through the Old Testament and the New Testament, each week we will encounter one of the women of the Bible who had faith and courage and intelligence and so, um, you know, so oftentimes a lot of characters in the Bible are men. Um, and then sometimes the women are there too. And this time I wanted to focus on some of the women of the Bible. And, and Proverbs 31 is probably the best chapter in the Bible about what, a, what God looks for 
and a woman of faith, a wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings good to him, not harm all the days of her life. And it's interesting, it says, and her lamp does not go out at night. Uh, most you women know what that's like. Um, you stay up late getting all the kids done with a you know, bath and brushing their teeth and everything else. Um, when I had little girls, um, we kind of, Rhonda and I both had our duties and such. Mine was to play with them. She was to make sure they brushed their teeth, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. I had the better part of it. Um, I also coached them in ball and, you know, helped them do their chores and taught them things. And I like this part in uh, Proverbs 31. Her children arise and call her blessed. Moms, how many of your children arise and call you blessed every morning? I'm, I'm waiting. Yeah. <laughs> and her husband also. And he praises her. Husbands, do we do that? Well, Proverbs 31 has changed a bit nowadays because I don't know of a woman here that makes her own clothing by spinning yarn and stuff. But uh, everything else, though, remains the same for a woman of... Huh? Yeah, they, 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 yes, they order their clothing now. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. Some things have changed. Technology has changed. But guys, a wife of noble character is still the same. Amen. Well, today I'm going to talk about a woman from the Old Testament. Some of you may know of her. Many of you will not. She only gets one chapter to talk about her story in 1 Samuel. Her name was Abigail. Now you're like, oh, I know that name. Um, in fact, women today are named Abigail. We usually call them Abby for short, but Abigail. Now let's go back into history. Ready? Let's go back into history. Y'all ready, right? Uh, we need, we need some, some, some music to take us back. Thank you, Jeff, for that. I was more kind of a, doo -doo 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 -doo. we're going to go back. Anyone doesn't like history won't stay in this church. But I love history, history of just what was going on in the world, but also especially when it has to do with the scriptures. So we're going to go back in time to the time that Saul, the first king of Israel, was king. But Saul had messed up. He had left God far behind, you know, um, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And uh, Samuel, the great prophet, had to go to Saul and say, you know what, you've, you've done messed up. And God's done with you. And God is going to plan for another king to take your place. Saul, Samuel, the great prophet, goes out and he finds the next king of Israel. And the next king of Israel is out watching sheep on the fields. Now, Jesse, his da um, David's dad, had several sons, and he prayed at all the sons for Samuel, and God kept saying, nope, 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 nope. And then he had to ask Jesse, do you have any other sons? Well, yeah, I got my young one. He's out there. He's dispensable. That's why we put him out there with the wolves and the sheep. <clears throat> and he's out by the sheep. Well, can I see him? And when David came in, God said, he's the one. He's the one. He's the next king of Israel. And so Samuel uncorks his flask, and he anoints David, this probably younger, like teen, well, teenage kid anyway, and anoints him as the next king of Israel. <clears throat> now that gets out. Now Saul's mad. Saul threatens to kill David. And so David has to go out into the wilderness, up into the hills and such, to live because Saul does not want him to be the next king. He wants him dead. Got it? Well, in chapter 25 of 1 Samuel, 
Samuel passes away. Samuel, the great prophet, it, it, um, gets older and he, he dies. And David, it says, is living out in the wilderness, but he has some people with him. A few months back, I told you about David and his mighty men. His mighty men were 40 men that were extremely good at combat. They were special forces. Because they had been fighting the Philistines, they had been fighting other roving bands and pirates and everyone else that would come into a weakened Israel. And they would come through around harvest time and steal what they wanted and disappear. Well, David had these 40 men, special force guys, um, that are extremely good at combat. And then David had developed a group of people that followed him. Well, one, David was a, was a leader. David was good at strategy, good at setting things up, a man of great faith, and people just wanted to follow him, and they knew that he was going to be the next king of Israel. And so he had amassed about 600 men that they would kind of just keep the hills with all these pirates and all these bandits that would come in and Philistines that would make an encroachment on them. Um, they kept them out. And so now that we go on with the story here in First Samuel, chapter 25. <clears throat> A certain man was very wealthy, and his name was Nabal. Now, Nabal was stingy, was ill-tempered. Apparently, he made business deals that were not, uh, were not right. It says he had, th had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep. How many goats and sheep? Anyone here have goats and sheep? No one? Y'all are poor. We had one person in early service, Mark Swide, and he said, I have 23 goats. I was like, Mark, you're the richest person in this church. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. Abigail's a pretty name, isn't it? Now, it's interesting people name their kids Abigail, but no one names their son Nabal. I don't know why. Now, in, in this, this part of the scripture, it says something about Abigail. She was intelligent and a beautiful woman. Two good attributes, right? But then it has a comma, but her husband was surly. <laughs> you women can go like that. And mean in his dealings. Well, David was in the wilderness, and he had watched over everyone in that valley, but you know, you need to feed people. When you have 600 men, imagine how you feed those people. And so he sent some people to Nabal, ten, ten guys from his company, and said, go and, and ask him if he has any food to spare. That we've been watching his land, no one's touched his, his crops, no one's touched his, his uh, animals, um, and part of his wealth came because we were protecting it. And he said, basically, just whatever they can find for us. So he sent his people, and Nabal, he lived up to his, his, uh, his reputation. One, Nabal was surly, ill-tempered, not particularly moral, I don't think, from what I kind of read of the scripture, and he was not very intelligent. Apparently Abigail in the marriage had all of it. Now you're thinking, why is Abigail... Why did she somehow fall in love with this guy named Nabal? 
Well, remember, it was a time that people didn't marry for love. Nowadays, we, we get all gushy and we want to marry someone. And uh, we do little turtle dove sounds until we get married. And uh, we live happily ever after, right? Here's the late, latest ones that I, I put together. He now blames me for putting them together. You, you can't do that. But imagine it was arranged marriage. Nabal was wealthy. Here was a woman that a father said, hey, that'd make a good match. And they probably put them together long before this. But now she is there and she's going to be a good wife, even though I suspect she doesn't respect her husband a lot because of who he is and what he's like. He couldn't have been a very good mate being mean spirited all the time, you know. But the ten representatives go to Nabal and say, hey, my master, you know, David, he, you know, if there's any food, extra food that you guys have, we could appreciate it. And Nabal said, who is this David? Well, of course he knew David, but he was, he was just kind of giving David a backhand and making fun of his men. Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered from my shears and give it to men coming from who knows where? That did not settle well with David's men. David's men left there after being cursed at, we find out later. They get back on their horses and they travel back to David. And when they tell David what happened down there with Nabal, David is furious. And he tells his men, put your swords on, boys. In fact, if it was a western, he'd say, mount up, right? And he and 400 men... There we go. That's David. Remember this from Big Country? It's a great movie. And he goes, and then other people come in, and pretty soon they've got a huge army going to take care of whatever it was in the Western. Y'all remember that movie? Okay, must have been before your time. All you guys are young. And so he, he mounts up his men, 400 of them, and he keeps 200 back at camp. And they all have their swords on. They're ready for combat. He's got his special forces guys with him. And they move down the mountainside towards Nabal's ranch. He's planning on taking care of Nabal. How dare him treat his people like that? Now, disaster is coming. A servant came up to Abigail and said, i, I got to tell you something. When, when you weren't here to see it, some people came from David and they, they, they asked for some food and they were turned away rather rudely. And this is how he talks to Abigail, this servant. David sent messengers from the wilderness to give our master his greetings, but he hurled insults at them. Yet these men were very good to us. He's talking about when he was out working the fields. They did not mistreat us the whole time we were out in the fields near them, and nothing was missing. In other words, David's men did not steal a thing. Night and day... I like this. Night and day they were a wall around us the whole time we were herding our sheep near them. In other words, they didn't have to be worried about um, bandits coming and, and killing a few people and taking off a lot of the, the uh, stock. They were safe. Now think it over and see what you can do because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. This is kind of how Nabal was. 
And that's why I always feel sorry for Abigail in this marriage. And so Abigail's like, oh no. Now it does not describe in here whether Abigail and Nabal had any kids. My assumption is he had children. So now she's worried about her children. She's worried about her house. She's worried about her husband. She's worried about herself. What if David comes in and swoops in and just annihilates everyone that stands in the way? And remember, it says that Abigail was intelligent. And so she begins to think, how do we avert this catastrophe? Well, she acted quickly and decisively. She took 200 loaves of bread. Can you imagine the baker that day in the the kitchen? 200 loaves of bread. Two skins of wine, probably goat skins. That's what they typically would keep it in. Um, They would would put new wine in it and ferment it inside these big goat skins. And it says five dressed sheep. It does not say how they were dressed. My opinion is they were probably in overalls, but I, I don't know. They were dressed. Thank you, thank you. Early service really laughed and guffawed over. A couple people fell over in their chairs laughing. And anyway, five dressed sheep. Five sacks of roasted grain. Um, Roasted grain is ready for grinding. Okay, they've already done the major work on it to get it ready for grinding to make flour out of it. A hundred cakes of raisins and two hundred cakes of pressed figs. Um, That's how they preserve food back then. They would dry things out. We still eat raisins today. But what do you do about grapes? Grapes are only good for so long. And that's why they developed wine to preserve the calories and the food stock of grapes for a longer time. And then, of course, they learned that if you dehydrated grapes, they became raisins. Very sweet, a lot of carbs, um, some good natural sugars. And so, and then they would, they would stack them and, and compact them into a disc, and then they could easily be, um, be stored. Or if you were going on a trip, you'd take a couple of cakes and put it in your backpack um, so you could eat on them when you needed some nourishment. And the, the ancient peoples learned how to do all this, um, how to dry everything, how to preserve things, because food was scarce. And then she loaded them on donkeys. And then she told her servants, go on ahead, I'll follow you. But she did not tell her husband what she was doing. Smart girl. Because he would have said, no way. He would have demeaned her, most likely, and stopped this. Well, the story goes on that uh, as she was, as she was uh, coming up to see David, She saw David and his men coming. Dun, 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 dun. You know, they were all riding down, ready for blood and guts. And she got off her donkey. She went over as David slid off his horse. And she got down onto the ground. And she bowed to him right at his feet showing complete submissiveness during that day and time. If you had someone greater than you, a lot of times you would do this. And she said, you know, <laughs> well, she actually, she actually called the ball an idiot. She fell at his feet and said, pardon your servant, my Lord, and let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Please pay, pay no attention, my Lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. <laughs> this is her husband. He is just like his name, and his name was close to the word for fool. As for me, your servant, I did not see the men you sent. And now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives and as you live, and she goes on, and let this gift 
which your servant has brought to you, my Lord, be given to the men who follow you. And so she was averting catastrophe. She was smart enough to figure out she better go. And she showed humbleness and said, look, all these donkeys are loaded with stuff. That's yours. And then she did kind of a prophecy. It's almost like a spiritual prophecy. She said, even though people are looking to kill you now, which was Saul and his, his group who had put out a warrant for his arrest and, and, or, or death, wanted dead or alive. It all goes back to Westerns for me, you know. And so she said, even though people are looking to kill you, I know one day you'll be great and successful. She knew. And David said to her, may you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day. And that was one of the things she mentioned. I didn't want you to have to kill people. I wanted to keep blood off your hands. And then David said, go, in, go home in peace. I have heard your words and granted your request. He told the boys, all right, mount up. We're heading back home. And Abigail went home with the donkeys empty. Now, as she arrived home, she went in and just on cue, Nabal was having a party. And it says he was eating like a king. In other words, he couldn't afford a few raisin cakes for David's men, but he was going to eat like a king. I mean, they had everything at the banquet. If you look here, they had lots of bean dip, <laughs> fried chicken, pork rinds. No, peeps were not Jewish, no. Of course, neither were pork rinds, but anyway, just as I was thinking through that. But they're having a big party. And it writes in here that Nabal was very drunk. So she knew not to approach him. She knew not to say anything to him. Well, first of all, it's hard to reason with someone that's drunk. And I want to tell you, since we're on this right here, and, and, and it's meant to be in this as a very bad thing. Alcohol is bad. If you were only to walk around with me day in and day out and talk to people who have been, their families have been ruined by alcohol, I always say alcohol is just liquid stupid. You've heard me say that, right? It's liquid stupid. You take a perfectly normal person and give them alcohol, and all of a sudden they're stupid. And I'm, if I'm offending you, then you're the one I want to reach right now. Because in the use of alcohol, if you've been EMS or fire department like I was for a while, if you're a police officer or some kind of rescue group, a lot of the things that happen are because of alcohol or nowadays because of drugs. Now, a very conservative use of alcohol, I don't have a problem with. But if it goes on before, you know, after two drinks... I got a problem with it. I have, if you have seen with my eyes what alcohol has done, when I'm called into a suicidal time period with someone, alcohol's involved. Bullet holes in the ceiling, alcohol's involved. And you know what? Alcohol is a drug. It's a depressant. So if you're depressed and you're drinking, you're going to be more depressed. I have seen children abused. I have seen wives beaten, cars wrecked, lives ended, and basically people being stupid because of alcohol. And I always say, if you if you've never stopped, if you've never started drinking, don't. You don't know if you might be the next alcoholic, and it will ruin your life. And so it's interesting they point out that he was drunk, kind of like again, and seems to be a point of his life is to drink too much. 
And so if you have to drink in the morning to get going, if you have to drink at night to go to sleep, if you have to drink to cope, if you have to self-medicate with alcohol, if you have to drink so many beers in a weekend or it's not a weekend, you've got issues with it. Like I said, if you have wine with a dinner or you have a beer with a hot dog or whatever, it doesn't bother me. But when you go past that point, that's when it bothers me. And I don't want to clean up any more messes caused by alcohol. Everyone got quiet all of a sudden. The next morning, Nabal had a hangover. But he, she wasn't going to talk to a drunk Nabal. In fact, um, I, don't, uh, I don't usually talk to people that are drunk. I'm like, go home, sleep it off, and I'll talk to you later. I've had to go to bars late at night to pull people out of bars. Well, she didn't tell him anything from, until daybreak. Then in the morning... When he was sober, his wife to told him all these things, how David was coming with 400 men to kill him and wipe him out. That might have affected him some, but I think, knowing how stingy he was, you know, um, Jesus said, wherever your, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If people put their treasure in or either heart and, and their treasure is money and things like that, that's where their heart's going to be. And that's the wrong place for your heart to be. Your heart should be 100% for God. And so she said about all the, uh, the grain, the bread, the figs, the raisins, the wine, oh yeah, and, and the dressed sheep. And I think it was over the money part. But it says, his heart failed him. And he became like a stone. In other words, what it's trying to say here is he had a heart attack. Now, like I said, it may have been that people were going to come and kill him because he was disrespectful to some of the troops of David. Or it may have been that the wife went behind his back and gave out his stuff. Oh, and honey, I gave him your golf shoes, too. And about ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. In other words, he, didn't, he never got over the heart attack. Now, that's kind of a weird ending, isn't it? But that's not the end. When David heard that Nabal had died, she impressed him so much... that he sent someone to Abigail and apparently had him take flowers and some chocolates. Doesn't say that, but that's probably what happened. He took, he, he, he took Abigail flowers and chocolates and said, Hey, um, David, David would uh, kind of like to date you. And she was like, Oh. And chocolates. Someone in early service said they were dark chocolate or milk chocolate. And I said, Bible doesn't say. <laughs> but it does say that David sent word to Abigail asking her to become his wife. And Abigail and David were married sometime after that. And later, she would become the queen of Israel. And they lived together happily the rest of their life. Oh, I know it. I know it. Isn't that, isn't that nice? Yeah. And they lived happily ever after. This was the story of Abigail, a woman of great integrity and strength and courage and intelligence. And the Bible seems to show that these are the things that God looks for in a woman. 
And as we go through other women in our next parts of the series, we're going to see the same kind of things worked out. And there are going to be people of great faith, too. Because that's what God is looking for, is a woman with a heart of faith, first off. And then because of that faith, I believe we become more wise, we become more kind and giving and loving A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. And she is clothed with strength and dignity. She laughs at the days to come. You know, we all kind of worry about things that might happen one day. We worry about stuff that's not even come up, so we worry because we should have something to worry about. But in the Bible, we see that this woman of great noble character laughs at the future, laughs at the day to come, and she speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. Amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed the story of Abigail. Some of you knew that story. Some of you perhaps didn't. But it's always a, it, it's a person that we respect and a person of faith and courage and integrity and intelligence. Will you please rise for the benediction? Next week we'll have another person, a woman of faith from the Bible, and you'll have to figure out whether it's Old or New Testament. Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and share with them all that I have given you.